there's the multiple mentions of the provisions that he has. You know, the, the silver, the gold, the clothing. All of yeah. but, but a change in number. Yeah, at, at verse 5, we have the king giving to Naaman uh, 10 talents of silver, which is a heck of a lot of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold, also a lot of gold. And 10 changes of clothing. Uh, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And then uh, also gives them uh, two uh, changes of, of garments. You know, and, and the key to understanding this, is, is particularly, is you know, back here in uh, is near the end of verse twenty-six. So this is what Elisha says to Gehazi. Uh, did not any? Um, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time? Is it time to receive? The, the idea here is that even in these, these, these exchanges of gifts, that these are still in accord with what God desires. So that we need to be also judicious in, in the timing as well as with the, in the generosity of, of what is being given. So it's not time, you know, to, to take any of this now. The, the application of this, let's just talk about that for a second, of course, is, is also about the receiving of the, the, the tithes and the offerings in, in the house of the Lord. That they are to be, you know, uh, solicited and collected from the people, but at the proper time. Particularly when we're talking about, you know, tithes, you know, 10% of grains, herbs, animals, and the like. You know, until they're harvested, they really are, are, have essentially no value. They have potential value as they're growing in the fields. But until they're actually taken in, that, that God has provided his blessing upon, you know, those animals, those herbs, those grains, to the time of harvest you know God himself even directing that time too saying now it's time go and go and reap go and harvest and then we can be assured that the fullness of God's blessings have been set upon those herbs those grains those animals and the light. So that once again, it all comes back to God. His timing. His purpose. His giving. His will. Which is why uh, Elisha is impressing a, a, this upon Gehazi. Say, this isn't for you to decide. It's for the Lord to decide. Particularly because God will also use this as, as time to work upon the hearts of his people. Both law and gospel. Because, because we're human, it takes time for God's word to act. 
it takes time for well well on the one hand the word and the spirit work like that when we're talking about the matters of faith how that works within us because we are human and we are flesh is that that doesn't always happen so willingly right so god will use our own reluctance wow i've been blessed with a lot i really don't want to give my all, all of this to the church how do i know that they won't just waste this mint or this time or this rosemary or whatever it is and on the other side of that wow this is a relatively small harvest and and this 10 percent seems to be a lot that's coming away from my harvest see god would use his word of law to crush my stingy greedy heart in both of those circumstances and again that takes time so that this is this is one of the one of the lessons that's being taught here to Gehazi saying it is not time to take it because it has yet to work the fullness of God's blessing upon those to whom this lesson is being directed the same for us of course so that we we ought to see all things you know as as opportunities to let law and gospel uh exercise our flesh the law again to to curb my my stingy greedy impulses and then the gospel to motivate the giving out of a p- renewed and purified heart going of course i'll give 10% of my my herbs 10% of my spices on, on the other side of that and and now this is especially where the gospel comes in while the law is limiting because it's always there as as a curb as well as the mirror to reflect you know how how I'm not necessarily measuring up so great and even as a guide under the law 10% is what's required for the tithe the gospel would say not only am i glad to give 10% or in this case um i'll give you two talents of silver as opposed to the one for which you have issued a legal demand the gospel says i can do more than that because i get to do more than that the gospel isn't about i must but the gospel is about i may to 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 reflect my faith in the god who is so generous in his giving of his gifts to me so that's that's what that's what we see in that very key little I want one town of of silver hey let me give you two so that each of these uh sons of the prophets might have a full talent of silver and the requested you know one set of clothing well clothing certainly has value Th- these aren't people who would have closets filled with extra clothing. In fact, when you get new clothing, guess what happens to the old clothing? In 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 this time. Repurpose. Yeah, yeah, you chuck it. It's done. They are they are worn garments. And so you cast off those old worn garments and put on the new. This also is baptismal imagery. You know, we we take off the the worn flesh of the old Adam and we put on the new person in Christ 
the, the perfect robe of Jesus' righteousness is exchanged for our filthy rags of unrighteousness. And, and then reconnecting that back, because we have one more reference to the clothing um, in this chapter, and that was with the tearing of the clothing. A sign of humility, of, of penitence, of judgment, of sorrow, of contrition, of all of that. And also indicating, I need new clothing. I'm not just ripping this so that I could get new clothes. But it's signifying that I, I, I am in need for God to clothe me anew. So, so you know, because of what has now happened, and looking in in hope and expectation for God to fix it, to remake it, and to renew me. You know, forgiving me of whatever part I have in this um, in this episode, forgiving me, pardoning me, and sending me renewed forward. Just as the small catechism summarizes the teachings of the scriptures, with the forgiveness of sins comes salvation and new life. I know the small catechism says, uh, uh, with the forgiveness of sins is life and salvation. But to intensify the, the life, the new life, that's lived in the in the light of of our salvation of of the light lived in the light of eternal life and and that's what all is signified in the i need something new because we're moving we want to move forward in newness from this point because right now this is not a happy point it's not a happy time So again, this uh, would be a great chapter to just, you know, teach all of these different aspects of what holy baptism is. You know, very clearly, it's a washing, but not just a, but not just a, a, a ritual washing that, that conveys no spiritual power. You know, like the, like the dedication ceremony, uh, among some Christian traditions, where that, that, that baptism of, of children, of young children, really is of no significance other than they're being dedicated to God. And again, with the prayers to God that God would protect and provide them, I mean, those aren't, those aren't meaningless, of course. But it robs the holy baptism of the true spiritual power that it is. It washes away the leprosy of sin, freely and truly. For those who receive this water together with the faith that is, again, as the small catechism teaches it, in and with the water. It's, it's a faith that's created by the word that is comprehended in the command to baptize. Go ye therefore and wash with water all nations. That's what's comprehended in that, in that command. Go and wash all the people with water. And, and the term nations, uh, S, uh, S, Ethnos, or in plural, ethno, uh, ethne, ethne, in, in the Greek. This means all of the non-Jewish ethnic people. So it, it does certainly signify all nations, but very pointedly saying those who are not yet part of Israel. Because God wants them all to be part of Israel. God earnestly wants all people to believe and be saved by him. 
So it's a washing, and it's a true washing with a true spiritual power. We talked a, a little bit already about the clothing. It's the exchange for our rags of unrighteousness for Christ's perfect gleaming robe of perfect righteousness. And then in the power for new living, it's, it's these other details, including what, what is it time to do now? And always about redeeming the time. You know, and by the way, the leprosy then falls back on Gehazi. It says Naaman's leprosy. Why do you suppose it says Naaman's leprosy and not just leprosy? This is at the end of that chapter. This is a clue as to what this leprosy truly signifies. This is signifying, you know, the, the original sin of, again, Adam and Eve that is imputed to us, their children. You know, we weren't there in the Garden of Eden. We didn't eat that forbidden fruit, but that sin and its guilt come upon us. Just like this leprosy of Naaman now comes upon Gehazi. So that he might be rescued from it by the same God who has pronounced this judgment upon him. You know, th this is this is why we still live with the effects of original sin during our time in this life. Not because God hates us, but because God loves you and wants you to learn how to live by faith in his gracious forgiveness over and over and over again. Connecting it with baptism so that you would be renewed, restored, rewashed in your remembrance of your baptism every day, every hour, every minute, every, any moment that you need. So th this is where, as, as my favorite verse in the whole Bible, Romans, Chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work to the good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And that's an example of how even original sin, which is not what God likes, which is not good, God will use for our good. So that we recognize at every moment we need God's cleansing at every moment. Because this is something from which we cannot escape. This is also where Gehazi, though he's sent away at the end of this chapter, as it were, um, as white as snow. You know, and, and here um, the snow is being used as a, as a dirty word. Not that he would live under this judgment of God, but rather that he would come right back to this same God in, in contrition, in repentance and sorrow, with torn clothes saying, I need a new suit. I need a renewed flesh. You know, God, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God, pardon me for my sin against you against uh, Elisha. So again, that while it ends badly for Gehazi, it doesn't have to be the end of his story. You know, this is one of the reasons why this episode is written in the way that it is. You know, he's not irredeemably consigned to, you know, to help, but rather God would say, Come and be washed. Come and be healed. Come in faith to me, your, your God. 
even as he does this for us every single time we stumble and fall. All right. What else do you see here? So the letter says that the king of Israel is going to heal the leprosy, but then the king of Israel basically says, how can this be since I'm not God? Exactly so. Exactly so. Part of this is the is the wrong notion. And and we see this going all the way back into uh, Egypt and the Pharaoh. Why is the Pharaoh and any particular Pharaoh the king over Egypt? Did the people vote for him? No, they didn't vote for the Pharaoh. But they consent to Pharaoh's rule because he's thought to be half man and half God. And and this kind of view, wrong-headed that it may be, is very, very pervasive. That if you are the king, then, then either A, you are partially God in, in that place, or at the very least, you have curried the favor of your God, because otherwise you wouldn't be king unless your God allowed you to be king. Now, in, in this instance, there's, there's no real clear way to, to know if, if those can be distinguished here. But the bottom line is that this is why he addresses the king. Because the king is, I'm going to paraphrase Jesus here. The king is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, if you want to get to the God of Israel, you got to go through the king. And this is why the king is very clear saying, not me. There's no S on my chest. I, I'm not even Superman, let alone the God of Israel. And, and, and his penitence here, the sign of penitence and the tearing of his clothes is, is again a, a, a remarkable thing because he's so concerned for the proclamation of the truth that you know, Yahweh is the God of Israel. You know, the Lord Almighty is the only God in the world. Makes this abundantly clear so that there's no mistaking, hey, I didn't try to mislead these folks. And to the extent that I might have, you know, either by something I did or by something I failed to do, Lord, I, I repent. It's, it's also a great lesson in, in what Christian repentance truly is. We, and we see the same thing, by the way, in your hero in the scriptures. And if he's not your hero, he's mine. I forget which. Zacchaeus. The wee little man, right? And remember what he says after Jesus says, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house. And in the, in the following changes, you know, exchanges, he includes the, 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 the statement, Hey, if I have cheated anyone, I will restore that person fourfold. You know, it's an if. It's a, con it's a conditional statement. But that is the attitude of a true Christian. The notion that, hey, because of original sin, I have much for which to uh, repent. And because of original sin, I'm not even aware of all of the actual sins that I have committed. Just not. 
You know, many of them are unintentional, but nevertheless real. And, and so, like like in Zacchaeus, also here, like the king of Israel. If I did anything to mislead these people, Lord, forgive it. I repent of it. It's the same thing that we do today in praying the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. Which ones are those? All of them. And as this uh, explanation to the small catechism continues, even those of which we do not know. That's true repentance. You know, it's not trying to sum them up. Saying, well, I've only got three to confess today, God. But, but I'll share those with you. It's going, uh, the depth of my depravity is so profound, I don't even know. All right. What else do you see here? I want to ask about the dirt. Yes, and, and let's just kind of read this carefully just for the context. So verse 15 is now the dripping with baptismal grace, Naaman. He's gone into the water, dipped himself seven times. You, you know why seven, right? Completion. Completion. Yes, yeah. yeah, completion. And, and also signifying now he is filled with the sevenfold spirit uh, of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold graces. And, and yes, and now, and, and that it is complete. Nothing is lacking. God has done it all. You know, so that baptism isn't like a jumps, you know, holy jump start. Like, there you go. You just got your hot shot on your battery. Now, you have to go out and, and do this. Baptism is complete, and God continues to complete it through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That, that means in everything, everything pertaining to the spiritual life. God starts it, God continues it, God ends it. In it, it for the Christian, you know, at the end when we are ourselves translated into heavenly glory, the glory of Jesus. So, I just again wanted to set that context here. So. Then he, this is Nathan, Naaman, returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. In all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Uh, but he, this is Elisha, responds, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he, Naaman, urged him, Elisha, to take it. But he, Elisha, refused because it isn't time. So Naaman said, then if not, Please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth for your servant. Again, this is name. Will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Where is this earth being taken from? Where are we right now in this episode? Israel. Israel. Where are these two meal loads of dirt going? Syria? Yeah. So that this, this signifies the movement of holy ground. So again, a concept well known all the way back to, to Exodus when God encounters Moses or Moses encounters God, if you will. 
in the burning bush. And what does God tell Moses? As, as Moses comes over going, wow, a burning bush. And it's not being consumed. This is odd. And, and God begins to speak to him and tells, tells Moses what about his sandals? Take them off. Because? Holy ground. Yes. And now think about that. So if he takes his sandals off, where is he standing? Holy ground. Holy ground. Why does he have to take his sandals off? Because his sandals have other ground on them. Exactly. His sandals have other ground on them. And now he is truly standing on holy ground. And by the way, he is worthy in his flesh to be standing on that holy ground because he is a faithful uh, child of this same God. So now Naaman bringing this back to signify, guess what? There's holy ground now in Syria. To give a visual reminder, you know, it's, it's God's word that sanctifies the world. It, it's all holy ground in the sense of Wherever God's people are, there is holy ground because God sanctifies that ground for the sake of his people. So your homes and, and this cute little shack, this is a holy house of God because God himself sanctifies it so that it is a temple worthy of his presence as well as the presence of his people. You know, and, and with your homes as well. So this is what is being signified, going, let me take back the earth so I can bring it to my people and say, here it is. This is now holy ground for all who believe. And then, of course, extending it beyond that to say, but it's not just this, it's not this dirt. You know, it's not a, it's not a magical dirt. It's not, there's no superstition tied with it as in here, you make, make sure you sprinkle some of this on your, your kitchen floor mm -hmm. and don't sweep it up. It, you know, that's not what it means, <clears throat> but it means that now there's holy ground in Syria or wherever Naaman goes because he's a baptized child of God. God will go with him. God himself will prepare the way. God himself will make it holy ground. And again, the visual reminder to anybody else, because it's a great question. Hey, Naaman, how was your trip? Good. What you got on those mules there? Dirt. You know that, that leprosy that I had? It's yeah. gone. Yeah, <laughs> what happened to that? And they'd be like, did you roll in the dirt, Naaman? No. <laughs> no. In fact, in the opposite, I rolled in the water. <laughs> and through that water, now every step I take is I take on holy ground. More about living here with, with our own dirt, but living that in such a rejoicing way, saying, so what's with the dirt? Because I'm clean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> paradoxical. Yep. Everything <laughs> in the Bible is a paradox. Light, darkness, water, dirt. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it really is just that, that simple. Even here in, the, in verse 18, th this is worth spending a little time here because Naaman is a servant of his own king and and saying that in order to win my master's uh, an audience with my master about this i'm i'm gonna have to go about some of my own business because mm -hmm. he's talking about yeah when i go into the temple and and bow down as i have I, I'm, I, 
I'm going to continue that for a time, but it's different now. Now it's, it's not in worship, but it's in witness, in witness to the truth, especially as he does this, but then acts completely differently thereafter. Hey, what's up with you? Well, I'm, I'm doing this so that I can demonstrate to you that this is empty. This is an empty ritual because there's, there's no God in it. There's no Holy Spirit in it. You know, again, this, we don't want to push this too much as to say, well, then, you know, we can live like the world. It's that we live among the world. And, and so that at times, and I'm going to go back to at the times that God himself appoints to say, I, I, I'm, this is how I put it in, in my own words. I'm willing to run this risk for the for the good that it will do. And, and just an example of that is that I talk to a lot of people uh, in any given day that have a lot of wrongheaded notions about religion things. I don't correct them every time. I I can't because I'd I'd run out of time. But 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 we address it in the me- in measures where okay that one I need to speak to and I and I and there's an opening to speak to very naturally and then I'll just you know re- reframe it recast it and give them something else to think about you know but I don't correct all their heterodoxy all at once that's what's going on in verse eighteen it's not an endorsement of 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 worship of false gods or participation in false worship but rather this is what I must do in order to continue to have an audience with my because otherwise if he he just simply refuses he ends up like Daniel Mm -hmm. in the lion's den Mm -hmm. and then what good is he well if God delivers him that's one thing but if he ends up more like Joseph, cast into prison and forgotten, mm-hmm. well, he's not benefiting the king at all. Again, with you know, absent God's intervention, of course, like he did with Joseph. Again, in that third part, Gehazi's, um, Gehazi's greed, because again, he eyes also, you know, back to Jared's original point, you know, Gehazi has become aware of this 10 talents of silver, because you can't hide that. Uh, 6,000 shekels of gold, can't hide that. 10 changes of clothing. And so Gehazi, in his, in his envy, in his greed, you know, plots to take his neighbor's money and goods even by false dealing. Oh, yeah, there's these two sons of the prophet. I mean, it, that, that makes it even worse when it's in the name of the Lord. Hey, these are servants of God. They could really use your help. This brings to mind the Hank Williams Jr. song where he talks about the televangelist. Uh, where he says, you know, they want you to send your money to the Lord, but they give you their address. Now there are some preachers on TV with a suit and a tie and a vest. They want you to send your money to the Lord, but they give you their address. Because all of your donations are completely tax-free. God bless you all, but most of all, send your money. That's what Gehazi is doing, you know, invoking the name of, of, of God and saying, well, we could really use your help in, in providing for these sons of the prophet. You know, because after all, they're, they're men of God. They're, they're preachers of the word. And, of course, you got a lot. All we're looking for is just, you know, one, one talent of silver, which is a lot, and two articles, of, you know, two, two suits of clothing also valuable and of course 
in his in his generosity. Here, take two. And just shows how sin begets sin begets sin. So the greed uh, led to to lying, led to thievery, led to more lying. Hey, Gahazi, what have you been up to? Oh, you know, hanging out. <laughs> Liar. And also the the warning for 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 God's people as a whole. No, no, no. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That applies not only to a, a Christian community and a Christian congregation, but also to the individual Christian. A little sin soon becomes a great big lump. And it becomes manifest. This even as now Gehazi's leprosy. But still God is merciful and would and would urge him to repent, to turn around, come back to him in faith. Naaman was not one of the chosen of Israel, but he is now a member of of Israel. Yeah, very a very important point. He is he is not of Israel by bloodline, by birth, but by rebirth. And that's always been true. It will always be true. You know, not all Israel according to the flesh is Israel according to the spirit. And again, very missional here in its, in its tone. So that it, it wasn't like God's people are saying, well, we don't have to, we don't have to go out and do missions because after all, you know, we're, we're born into it. But rather this, there was an invitation throughout the Old Testament to come and join our family. In the Old Testament, it's tied to a particular bloodline visibly according to the flesh but only until the last of that generation comes which is Jesus and then the lineage ends well, that's how God would have us look at it mm -hmm. and now we too are of Israel but again by virtue of our own rebirth into the one who is the the culmination, you know, the Israel in one flesh, you know, who went from where it from where it originated, you know, he who wrestles with God and overcomes, you know, this this is Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. Yes, I yet know why. You know, and, and that's, and again, very much intention for the Christian all the time. You know, so that, so that again, we live by faith and that faith also teaches us we have it all now and yet not yet. It's one of my favorite paradoxes in the scriptures. Now and not yet. Do we have salvation? Yes. Now. Today is the day of salvation. Because you believe today. And yet not yet. Not in, in terms of its, its full fruition and flowering. Well, flowering and fruition to put it in proper order for the bio, biologist here. But yes, yeah, so that there was always a missionary call to Israel too, you know, to invite the the, the nations, the Gentiles, join us. You know, and we, and we have several examples. We have Naaman here. We have Ruth. Um, 
and of course there's there's many many others but those are just to, to name but two that yes now they who are not israel by nature have now become israel by faith again that also teaches us the reality of of our own origin and also for those who are uh, israel jewish if you will in the old testament era that their their birth into those families didn't guarantee anything other than they're in a fleshy family but when they were likewise brought into spiritual israel through the hearing of the word and receiving of the holy spirit then they were likewise reborn through all the old testament sacraments that god provided for that purpose of birthing and renewing and and, uh, continuing to grow that faith.